Welcome to the dark forest Jackie and her pals will never bore us Shameless confessions about our obsession Will make us laugh and smile So let's explore the dark forest And dork down for a while Hey, it's Jackie Cation. Welcome to the Dork Forest. You know the websites, JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com, TheDorkForest.com, FamilyPetAncestry.com. You're probably already there. Let's do the credits. Mike Rickberg composed and sang that song with his wife, Sarah, that you just heard. He's going to sing his version of the Mexican hat dance at the end of the program. Patrick Brady is going to fix this audio, and Vilmos works on JackieCation.com, the website. There are many ways to support the show. The Amazon link is one. You can use an Amazon link from JackieCation.com or DorkForest.com to go to Amazon. You order like normal and it supports the show. There is a straight up donation button, PayPal or Venmo to this uh, email address that is mine, Jackie at JackieCation.com, where you can just donate to the show if you like the show a lot. I think PayPal has figured out a way to do a monthly. If you want to go monthly, please do. Other ways to support the show if you want to is you can buy merch. There's Dork Forest t-shirts and all the shirts are union made here in America. So they run a little big. Union Bayside. So if you want to look up their size chart. And then the other merch is my stand-up merch. On JackieCation.com, you can watch me do stand-up. You can look at my schedule and the stand-up merch, a couple of different t-shirts, a couple of different enamel pins, and all my CDs and my DVD. If you want to live stream my DVD, it's over there at ComedyFilmNerds.com. They have a live streaming capability, or you can get a hard copy of the DVD on my website. Oh, there are premium episodes at Bandcamp. The dorkforest.bandcamp.com has probably 10 episodes that were done live. They cost me a couple of bucks to make, so I charge you a couple of bucks. If you've run out of regular episodes, go over to ba- the dorkforest.bandcamp.com and get some more. Other than that, I say this. Let's get into the show. Hey, it's Jackie Cation. I'm in my living room. What is happening, Courtney Joyner? Friend of uh, Monster Party podcast. That's how we met. An intense friend of Monster Party, <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Courtney Joyner, you guys, uh, you're a writer, a screenwriter and a script writer and, and a novel writer and all the things, right? Yes. If people go to Amazon and look up your name, they will find your works, possibly? Yes, they will. They'll actually find quite a few. There you go. So uh, that that is, uh, now you know who you're talking. That now, now we all know how to find you. And he also has a board game. Him and Andy were talking about it. It was it was uh, bleeding into dork forest time. So I had to, sh- <laughs> had to shut it down. Had to bring bring you into the living room. And I'm so, still bleeding. And Exactly. So, but the, the game you made, Courtney, is called Nemo Rising. Uh, yes. Robur the Conqueror. That's the adventure, Robur the Conqueror. Yeah, and it looks uh, looks super respectable, and uh, it's coming out. It should be out probably when this come when this drops. Uh, this will be out in store. So if they don't find it, they should go to Board Game Geek and sort of look at it. And um, absolutely. And then they should go to their local game store and request it because it'll be in a lot of independent game stores because you have pretty good distribution. But um, but if you don't see it, Nemo Rising. So uh, do that, and it's. It's cooperative. It's a cooperative game, which I it think is. is great. And and this was quite a little adventure uh, for me because the designers and uh, the folks at WizKids and everything are, really had to kind of take me by the hand and guide me <laughs> through this process. Because even though I, mean, I graduated high school in 1977, <laughs> so that was right when Dungeons and Dragons and all that stuff was exploding, and I never played once. Oh, my gosh. So I was a complete board game Nimrod. Right, right. Well, you are you are brand new to the whole gaming thing, and you totally. said that this had been, this had been pitched in like three other iterations. Like you're like, can we make it? Uh, this was this was <laughs> uh, Nemo Rising. Actually, began as a old a spec pilot I had written as the return of Captain Nemo twenty four years ago. Okay. Wow. And it kept getting optioned, and different people got involved. Did and, you buy land? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> uh, I bought some chili dogs. Excellent. <laughs> that was. There's uh, always a sal- a free yes. salad involved. And we kept getting close. And we kept getting close. And I actually got uh, finally got involved with a producer named Amy Krell, who was terrific. And she got it to an English production company. So I fly to England. Hugh Bonneville. From Downton Abbey, okay, is now attached to play okay. Captain Nemo. Good Lord. Haley Atwill is attached as oh, our female Peggy Carter. Lead. Sure, absolutely, Peggy Carter. 
And so we have this reading in London, and the producers of Downton Abbey are there, and it's just, it's like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. And, of course, and they couldn't get the money. You know, this is the story of so many sort of really, I mean, there's there's so much great stuff on TV that you're like, and then you think about the stuff that never made it, and you're like, oh, all right, well, okay, whatever. So it, you almost got, uh, because Nemo's fantastic. I mean, the story mm-hmm. of Nemo is, is, I don't even remember the origin of the Nemo story. Do you? Well, the whole thing is when, when a lot of people go back and they read Jules Verne, which is one of, if anybody, if they love what I did, if they hated what I did, and it still made them go back and read those <laughs> books. And that's great. That's Ooh, a victory. A win. That's, yeah, yeah. that's an absolute win. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, when people read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, they're kind of uh, – a little surprised that so much of it is devoted to like fish, right? And the exploration <laughs> of undersea right? life and things like that. And it does resemble the very famous Walt Disney movie, uh, but it doesn't. Okay. And so uh, when uh, Vern himself, actually, you know, they always wonder because we think of like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and things right. like that, where Captain Nemo is seen as a Raj. Yeah. We well, see that's a little bit of a false equivalency as well, because originally he was Russian. Ah. And Jules Verne's publisher said, look, we can't upset our Russian readers, so oh. you've got to change this. Oh, wow. So he like scrambled to find a different origin point for him, kept the Russian description. Suddenly he's uh, like a half caste Raj. Yeah. Educated in England. So it was kind of this big free for all. Here's what I don't know enough about Jules Verne. I've, I've read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, not for decades. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, your description of fish uh, leaves me slightly uh, less excited. But um, the... Where was Jules Verne from? Was he British? No, he was French. He was French. Okay, so that's why they cared about the Russians. All right. Yes. Uh, that's what I needed. And um, and so they made him Indian and then... Um, kind and, of... And, and then the British. I, yes, and, the okay. idea being like the mother the was, was Indian and the father was, was British. Right. And, you know. which, which, hap- which was enormously common. Absolutely. So uh, interesting, interesting. And so... Okay, now, uh, and when was, when did Jules Verne write that book? I can't remember. Was it early 1900s? No, it was in the uh, 1880s. Okay. And the thing was, with with Verne, of course, and a lot of the background uh, for the stories, and people kind of forget that, had to do with the American Civil War, because that's what was going on in a lot of the time when he was writing 20,000 Leagues, and, you know, the war, of course, was over by that point, but still... It would uh, have affected so much. Yeah. Very much so. And the perception of the United States and all yeah. of that, because that was the big conflict that right. everybody knew about. And so, uh, but he even messed up his own timeline because uh, when he wrote Mysterious Island, okay. after 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, he turns it in, the publisher reads it, it's basically Robinson Crusoe, and he goes, now, look, you got to throw Captain Nemo in here someplace. <laughs> He's like, okay. So he throws Captain Nemo into Mysterious Island, and he's at the end of the book, and he's this old man, and he's dying on the beach of Uh-oh. Mysterious Island. Wait a minute. Even I saw that. You see the problem here, <laughs> that Mysterious Island chronologically actually takes place before 20,000 right. Leagues Under the Sea. So, right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. he, yeah, continuity wasn't You know what was mysterious about suit. that? Yeah. It was super <laughs> mysterious. That it was, that was very a, mysterious. That, yes. that was available. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was kind of growing up with that stuff, and especially like the wonderful version with, with Herbert Lom and the giant crabs and all that wonderful Ray Harryhausen monsters. Oh, right, right. And, yeah. The stop action. Yeah. That was, that was kind of my kitty matinee fodder and, Okay. With famous monsters of film land and all those wonderful things, that kind of fantasy adventure. And that's what I tried to replicate when I wrote the novel. And then the novel became the game. The game. Okay. So, yeah. So there is there is a history of a love of monsters and stuff like that. But you wanted to dork out about westerns. Yes. And possibly monsters. Are there monsters in westerns? Oh gosh! Besides, fact, I watched. It, I was watching like twenty five minutes of Valley of Guanji before I came over. Here, not so. Valley of Guanji. The Valley of Guanji. <laughs> what is Valley of Guanji? Uh, oh, oh, that's the great uh, Ray Harryhausen movie with James Franciscus and uh, Richard Carlson, and they go into the Lost Valley in the eighteen hundreds, and they find the dinosaur. And 
What? Guanji, the Tyrannosaurus what? Rex, and bring him back and put him in a Wild West show? Because basically it's King Kong, but done as a Western. Land of the Lost. What the heck is happening here? There um, you go. What year was this? It was a, that was a Harryhausen movie? Yes. Okay. Uh, so 1969, that- I believe. I saw it originally... With Dracula's Wizard from the Grave at the Bala Theater in Philadelphia. Oh, little so. double uh, one-two punch. Little, little one-two punch. All yep. right. It's. Uh, did you grow up in Philadelphia? Yes, I did. That's what. That's what. That you weren't just traveling when you were. No, no, years I'm old. totally Doctor Shock and the whole <laughs> thing. So yeah. Okay, so so monster westerns have got to be a very specific genre, like that one. So they bring him and they put him in a Wild West show. And, of course, he escapes and causes oh, problems. Well, yes. well, why? How can you introduce a monster into the plot and have him not escape? Uh, that's a terrible... I always think about... Um, uh, I've been working on this thing about how Godzilla is usually the ally. Like, he's usually a good guy. Well, he, he well, you know, they kind of switched it around after... Godzilla versus the Thing, which okay. was Godzilla and Mothra. Yes, and I actually I really like that one. Actually, uh, then, what makes that one such a good one? Well, it's a couple of things. You know, the the original Godzilla suit, remember, was built with like sea sponges and things. Okay, and so his appearance always kind of changed <laughs> from <laughs> no, film to film okay. a little bit. And that one just has a little bit more of an edge. It's rather violent and bloody, which is a little surprising right. for it. But the fantasy aspect of Mothra and the the, the little twin fairies and the okay. golden coach and all of that <laughs> stuff, you know, that's the that was the fun of it. And uh, when, uh, of course, we the poster is this like tentacled monster fighting Godzilla. Right. And it says, what is the thing? Well, you don't know it's a giant moth. So Right, little, right. So it doesn't yeah, have any tentacles. Yeah, it's, a little, it's a little more <laughs> yes, passive than what's uh, on the uh, wonderful poster by Ronald Brown, by the way. Okay. Painted yeah, that yeah. artwork. Oh, very nice. Uh, but, you know, after that, Godzilla, like Godzilla Monster Island and some of the others when his son appeared. Okay. You remember him? And he would blow the smoke rings. Oh, kind of. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's when Godzilla and his face kind of changed from being dragon-like and and like a dinosaur. And he kind of had this permanent grin. Okay. Yeah. Is that when he becomes the good guy? That's when he became more of the good guy. It was never Gamera. It was never, you know, Gamera is here to help old children. It was never that. Okay. No, no, no. (laughs) Is Gamera always been the good guy? Yes, Gamera's always been. Interesting. Yeah, the, the flying turtle's always been. Okay, and the, yeah, yeah. But also, too, remember when King Kong attacked Tokyo? They Godzilla really was the one who defended his homeland. That, that's when I. That's when I think of. That's when I think of him being a good guy. Yes, is when when he does that, and uh, just kind of because all of these monsters, even Gamera. When you think about them being the good guy, they're also creating a great deal of wreckage. Oh, tremendous! Um, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of things that they're they're beating up here. Have Have you seen the new Godzilla movie? I saw the second to last one. The yes. same guy wrote it, uh, but I I liked that one. This one I heard was not as good. Uh, no. Uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> but the first one I kind of liked. Um, but you know what the thing is about, and I and I like it. Look, I'm a love anything with a monster in it, so I'm <laughs> halfway home anyway. But you know the thing is, I'm like, you know, gosh, if they would only go back to a visual style that was representative of these movies in the night early '60s, that wildly technicolored look. Okay. Because now everything's the brighter in, colors. Everything or? is in the rain and it's rusty and oh, it's right, falling right. apart and you can't see anything and everybody's brown and right. Talks we have in the technology to super the... zoom in Avatar yeah, exactly <laughs> and it's like wait a minute guys well how about the Mysterians how about all those fantastic Japanese monster movies that were just this wild fantasy kind of rainbow right. of, of colors and presentation. And they've gone the exact opposite direction with it. Yeah. Everything is kind of grayed out a little bit. It's Very unfortunate. So. Yeah. Like the last monster movie I saw was Colossal, which was um, with uh, Anne Hathaway. And mm-hmm. I saw it on Hulu. And uh, I don't know that it would, would you call that a monster movie? Uh, I don't know. That's that's a tough call. Kind kind of sort of. I loved yes. it. Yeah. I thought it was. I thought it was an excellent twist, and then uh, and it had a very satisfying ending. Yes. So, uh, but it was, but some of the like some of the monster the early monster movies, I felt like they they literally the plot was just 
a child holding two monsters uh, hitting them. Like, there didn't seem like there was a lot more plot to it. Am I wrong? Well, it really depended on, you know, the context, of course. There's a dozen of them, so... Going back to, like, the 1950s, when everybody was so concerned about the atomic bomb, it became the source for literally every giant creature right, to that show g- up. showed up at our door. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't matter if it was Tarantula or the Deadly Manus or the Black Slime. Scorpion or whoever it was. You know, there it is, and it's the it's the atomic bomb. And, of course, that was also Godzilla. Mm-hmm. But what I love, uh, have you ever seen Gojira, the Japanese version? I think I did. It's uh, I haven't seen them. In, I mean, whenever I hang out with those monster party guys, I'm just like, oh, they're all about Godzilla, it's, right? They're yes. all and and they are so dipped that um, let's let's say that I haven't seen it good, well enough to know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> well, the thing is about about the the first film, and this this kind of is where everything else launches from, is it's about Hiroshima and the aftermath of <clears throat> Hiroshima, and this giant lizard is in fact basically the revenge for our having dropped the bomb oh the, and do does it go to america no he does not okay but that is really this is that was such an incredible disturbance such an incredible loss of life that something had to erupt basically from mother earth oh right because of it and godzilla was the result oh that's kind and of they just keep going further and further away from those original <clears throat> thoughts but that movie was made in what i think 1955 Right, literally less so quickly after the absolutely, bomb. yeah. So, yeah. So the the motivation is much different. So when we bring uh, monsters to the old west, yes, uh, who's doing this <laughs> besides the Japanese? <laughs> well, it's usually uh, a prehistoric creature that is essentially in some lost valley that is unexplored. Uh, perhaps there was. Uh, an Indian encampment or something. Right, right. And, something. And they, they would revere it as a so, god. Something mystical. Something mystical. And it's exactly. a box canyon nobody ever goes into. That's it. it. <laughs> and then suddenly cattle start getting eaten or whatever the problem is. And they go and they find out. That's uh, the Beast of Hollow Mountain with the, Guy Madison. Oh, really? Now, yes. what is that one, the Beast of Hollow Mountain? No, that's, uh, that's, that's a great one. That is another dinosaur who appears. Uh, and there he inflicts a lot of problems on ranchers. Okay. All yes. right. So. And, Guy was, Madison. He I doesn't. En- he doesn't enjoy the land usage. After, what? Uh, w- when was the <laughs> Beast of Hollow Mansion made? I believe that was 1957. Okay, so a lot of this was. It, it also, I think, a response to Hiroshima. They're like, we love these monsters. Uh, now we're going to bring them into our favorite genre, the Old West. Yes. <laughs> so, well, well, that was the thing. Willis O'Brien, who of course did all the effects for the original King Kong, had had this idea going back to the silence. And oh. he had wanted to do something uh, along, and in fact, he came up with a storyline for Guanji and tried to get it made for years after he had done King Kong and couldn't. Okay. And remember, in Mighty Joe Young, it's cowboys who right. capture Joe. Okay. Ben Johnson and all those guys on horseback, remember, okay. capture him, and then he gets brought back to... Uh, sure, brought back to America. Uh, to that's right. Absolutely. Trot him out and ask yep. everybody for a quarter. That's uh, it. Yes, with so. his tin cup. Yes, beautiful dreamer. <laughs> that, uh, wow. So, are there any... Like, what, what are they... Are they still doing them? Cowboy monster movies? Like, when did they... Like, you've named three offhand. <laughs> yes. That, no, it's... um. In fact, there was an announcement yesterday that Guillermo del Toro wants to do a, uh, a horror western. Okay. Uh, that's going to be with werewolves. Okay. So, and the werewolf western is very uh, organic to the genre because, of course, of the belief uh, it, within a lot of uh, Native American tribes of shape shifting. Right. They're shape shifting and there's wolves. Absolutely. And uh, uh, I, uh, what I know about Native Americans could fit a very small book. So, uh, but uh, the rumor mill <laughs> that has drifted past me, there's been, um, and then I, I worked for hippies for a decade. But uh, so, <laughs> and so I, I, I know about the co opting of the dream catcher. So, but those are the things that, uh, but I, so, but Del Toro, um, What's his name? Guillermo del Toro. Guillermo del Toro. Yes. If I slowed down, I probably would pronounce his name. <laughs> but yeah. So, but he just did the one with um, essentially a BPRD kind of, uh, where there was a, right. a, a Abe Abe Sapien uh, monster, a water monster. 
Right. So, which a lot of people say is really his version of Creature from the Black Lagoon. Which, oh, right, yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think I think Shape of Water qualifies for that. But but that uh, melding of the genres goes way, way, way back. It goes back to uh, literature uh, from the period, again, because so much mysticism and and the legends that abound it, because you're talking about now we're just so comfortable with our own country, we don't even think about it at a time when it was so sparsely populated and people right. did not know what was beyond in the darkness. And it right, could just have been miles away. Anything. It could have been Absolutely. anything. Absolutely. And so, uh, and ghost stories, of course, set in the West, uh, there are, they are plentiful. Vampirism mm-hmm. in the West. And uh, I saw Abe, Abe Lincoln Vampire Hunter. Oh, I did too. That was a, that was a delight. Yes, that, it was, uh, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I liked that very much. Have you ever seen Curse of the Undead? I did not see Curse of the Undead. Which yes, one's that's that a vampire? Is, that's vampires, yes. Uh, starring Eric Fleming of Rawhide. Oh, really? As the hero, a, a preacher who carves a crucifix on silver bullets to kill uh, the vampire played by Michael Pate. Oh, okay. Wow. Yes. It's, it was a uh, very famous... Uh, uh, Western bad guy, but was actually from Australia. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Good for him. And so that's from the 60s as well? Uh, 1957. 57. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. So everybody, um, so there's, and, and Clint Eastwood did it. Did Clint Eastwood? I saw Painter I did, Wagon, uh, and I've seen all of those uh, Sierra Leone movies. Uh, Sierra Leone. That's a country in Africa. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, who am I thinking of? <laughs> What's the no, name of that director? Uh, in, from? Uh, oh, Sergio Leone? Thank you. Yes. Sergio Leone. Um, <laughs> Everyone take a drink. Okay. Eastwood's always been very uh, demure in his answers about the reality. What it, does the ending of High Plains Drifter actually mean? Oh, okay. And is he, in fact, a, a ghost? Vet. Oh. Because we see him disappear. Oh, when right. When he rides off onto the rise. Right, right. He just, he fit. And he's supposed to be, yes, is he the reincarnation of the sheriff that they beat to death in the middle right. of the street and what mm-hmm. have you, because he comes back to, to get the guys who uh, did him in. And so that's, uh, I think that's always qualified <laughs> as a, uh, you know, as a horror is that, western. Is that good? That qualifies as a horror western? Oh, absolutely. All does. right. Sure. Is that the one where he made them paint the town red? That's the one. All right. I did like that one. That was yep. a, it, it felt apropos. That's and the uh, one. of apropos, how about appropriate words? Either, um, right. either absolutely fits. Either is apropos. <laughs> is it apropos? Of- <laughs> Excellent. So, <laughs> what on earth? Okay. So, but um, there was uh, yeah. I just I love the the your own yeah because you have uh, the thing is to be allow me to jumble around a bunch, but to <laughs> no be problem. on the monsters. Monster Party podcast, mm-hmm. he, they like people who have this depth of knowledge. And so what 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 sort of what are you watching now for are are do you it's monster movies I've always what I've recently found out about them is that they're not scary. No. Is they're just wonderful. They're just kind of great. And they're they're not they're usually not gory and they're and they're usually there's some tension. <laughs> Well, when I first started really professionally writing screenplays, and the first movies I had made were horror movies. Vincent Price started in the very first movie I ever wrote. Oh, my gosh. So, what was that called? Uh, the Offspring. All right. Oh, my God. Hello. I've even heard of that. No, there you and go. And there you go. <laughs> so, and that was done by myself and Jeff Burr and Darren Scott and a bunch of us. We knew each other in college. Okay. And so we get out of uh, USC in 1982. Right. And that was at the height of... You know, Halloween had come out, and Friday. So, and there was this way to make movies with tax shelter income and all this stuff. Oh, wow. Plus, the VHS explosion that happened. So, everybody needed films. Mm-hmm. So, it was a great time. But, you know, I, I get asked about that c- kind of frequently by, you know, you know, how do I break into the movie business? You oh, know, right, you know, right. 17 years old. And the thing is, now people can make movies on their phones. Yes. And editing software is automatically installed on their iMacs and all this stuff. When we were making our movies, guess what? You needed $100,000 just to start. Because you had to find the people to cut it. And it had to be on film and you had prints and negative, Mm -hmm. you know, all of that stuff. And you had to rent everything. And it was a whole different 
whole different deal. So when when uh, starting kind of in the, in that era, one of the things we all saw and we didn't like <laughs> was violence became synonymous with horror. Right. And I've, re- I've written a lot of violence in movies and things like that. But, uh, and the sl- slasher movies, of course, became very prominent. And, you know, I remember when uh, the movie Maniac came out and there was all these, you know, protests about it oh, and everything else. Warnings and, and... Oh, yeah. And, and the, the idea of the POV of the killer going after a woman and, and all of these things all became uh, questioned and questionable. But it, and now standardized. And now standardized, exactly. <laughs> but it even went further than that, that you could go to like horror film conventions and people were selling uh, DVDs of car accident. Oh, like videos. genuine st- snuff yes. films. And it was awful. I thought it was a terrible turn right. to take the fantasy, the supernatural, all of those things out of horror. And for, for a very brief period, there absolutely was no supernatural in horror at all. Oh, they just completely scrubbed it. They they really and, did. And you had to reinvent the wheel, kind of. I, th- I think that that happened. Fortunately, uh, John Carpenter and the guys who were you know really making their impact him. at yeah. the time. Carpenter, of course, uh, went his own ghost. Of course, Halloween is a, the original. It was just a masterpiece. But and he went his own way. T- I think himself to bring back to go to the fog. So that's a ghost story. Okay. And then of course, Wes Craven just, it was scorched earth with night, the first nightmare on Elm street. Okay. But thank God that movie exists because it brought us back towards something more fantastical. Right. Even though it was slashery and very violent, very violent, but it was not just someone deranged. Right. And attacking someone helpless. And the, our point of view is always the the bad guy, and the, which is such a weird. I mean, that's not gonna, uh, to some extent. And this is an opinion, obviously. Is I like the idea of art that sort of steps us closer to civilization, as opposed to a, a step away from it. <laughs> and you're like the celebration of, like Law and Order SVU. People are fascinated by it because I think of the of the justice meted upon the bad guys. Right. But I can't watch it because it feels like it glorifies the creep, you know, where you're just like, oh, you're explaining how this could be done in 30 different ways. And I, I don't want it. Well, you know, you're, you're hitting on something that's so such a basic narrative, uh, I think, flaw in a lot of things, at least, at least for me, is right. you – the – point of view of the victim if we're talking about horror or yeah. a, you know a, a thriller or something that is the point of view that you hope that most of the audience is going to relate to right not the point of not view the of the psychopath <laughs> exactly yeah. and so and of course you can build to things and 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 build to things because you want to show that this is a dangerous person and right and what have you but uh can you imagine Wait Until Dark, and we'll use that because Audrey Hepburn's blind, oh, right. if it was done entirely from the point of view of Alan Arkin's character? Oh, my God. Right. No. It doesn't... It, it wouldn't... And he would he, be very frustrated. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> it would, it would be a movie about frustration. Yes, it would. And so I think that's a that's a really big point uh, that you're making, especially in in things like fantasy and science fiction, because... In uh, the 1950s, when American International really exploded, uh, and this is before the Edgar Allan Poe's, but they were doing the black and white, uh, you know, science fiction double features at the drive-ins and stuff. The biggest change that they made in horror and science fiction movies was the heroes of their movies were the same age as the audience that was going to see them. Ah. It wasn't. Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi and right. those guys anymore. It was someone who was 17 years old. Yeah. Yeah. And so that totally changed the, the landscape. The perspective, yes. yeah. And I, I, you won't find a bigger devotee of the classic and then Hammer Horror and all the rest of it. But this was another way to go. But, but you were still from the hero's perspective. You're still, yeah. Steve McQueen has to deal with the blob. We're not right. the blob. <laughs> we're Steve McQueen. We are Steve yeah, McQueen. Exactly, yeah. Yes. It's, uh, that's, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. It's, it's like, it's, 
Yeah, I definitely, and and I know that there's there's amazing television being going going on, and some of it is so dark that I, I'm like, I would rather act in it, or and I've said it before, I would rather have acted in it or be killed by it than to watch it. Uh, open water. Uh, oh, open water, dude. Open water. I wouldn't have watched that on a dare. And uh, for example, but there's like a million, like you know, where I have to follow the bad guy, and I'm, I'm, he's been made sympathetic. You know, Dexter. I don't want any part of it. I'm just like, get some help, man. <laughs> it's. Do uh... you know one of the? I just fell in love. Of course, it was Eva Green, so that was very easy. Okay, but who's Pen- Eva Green? Penny Dreadful? Oh, right. Was just spectacular. Okay. Which I've been meaning to watch that. And, of course, you know, it's it's British and it's all, all those oh, right, things right. that I lo- love anyway. And <laughs> Timothy Dalton, it's like the best work he's ever done. He okay. is spectacular in it. But the whole thing that they did, which was just so wonderful, was uh, John Logan, who, you know... Uh, has written the last few James Bond movies, including Skyfall, of course, you know, okay. was the producer and wrote all the episodes. Wow. And, but the world of gothic horror, those original works, whether it's Mary Shelley or Robert Louis Stevenson or Bram Stoker or any of those people, that, they come from the continent. They don't come from the United States. Right. So that type of writing and that type of, if you will, gothic sensibility is yeah. like built into that culture. Yeah. So when they went ahead and did this show, and it's got Dorian Gray and Dr. Frankenstein and yeah. Dr. Jekyll and everybody in this thing, and it's just this glorious montage of all these characters coming yeah. together, and it it's just, it's wonderful. And uh, I will say this, that, oh my God, uh, Rory Kinnear's performance, if you haven't seen it yet, Rory Kinnear's performance of the Frankenstein monster is astonishing really he is so, so terrific penny dreadful i've seen the po- the billboards and i of course am always interested in this sort of stuff but what the what is it is it watchable on netflix or hulu or what am i think I well, it was made for hbo but it's okay. been off for a few years so now i think it's available on all amazon sorts of and yeah yeah. It, yeah and it might it still be on hbo yeah. go so okay so penny dreadful i can do that and uh because it yeah, i mean the gothic and sensibility and all that stuff that we love about those films, those those original, you know, explorations is all right there, but done, you know, right in I, a new way, and it's glorious too. It's beautifully made. They spent a fortune on it. My ad, my ad, my ad. I'm about to do an ad. Hey Rangers, it's an ad for a deodorant. You know, I've tried a million deodorants, and this one is great because it's formulated without aluminum, parabens. It's native. It's that's what it's called. It's called nativedeodorant.com. And if you use the promo code DORK during checkout, you get 20% off your first purchase. I've, I've tried a million other deodorants and Native is the only one that I've been using consistently because I love the way it smells. I, I got the lavender and rose. And if you make the switch to a natural deodorant, a lot of people think that you have to sacrifice because it it's going to be weird. It isn't. You don't sacrifice on odor or wetness protection. It turns out uh, that it works great. And it works great without aluminum, and which I have always... Um, try to avoid with deodorants. So Native comes in a wide variety of enticing scents for everybody. So whatever you like, you can pick a lot of different kinds of of scent. They release new limited edition seasonal scents too throughout the year. So there's also an unscented formula and a baking soda free formula for those who who are sensitive. The classic deodorant scents, coconut and vanilla, which is their most popular scent, lavender and rose, which is the one I got, cucumber and mint, and eucalyptus and mint. So it's very refreshing. And there's no risk to try, obviously. They offer free returns and exchanges in the United States. Go to nativedeodorant.com and use the promo code DORK during checkout and get 20% off your first purchase. Let's get back into the show. I, I picture the, the only the separation from that sort of continental gothic thing to the U.S., like the, the American model is more of a noir kind of thing. Like I remember Abbott and Costello meet uh, some monsters. Remember that movie? Oh, um, Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein? That's it. At my absolute favorite. I, <laughs> it is a delight. Fantastic. <laughs> I wish I owned it. And honestly. who's the hero, though, of that film? Who is the hero? Lon Chaney Jr. is the wolf man, remember? He's oh, really? the one who's searching 
for oh Glenn's uh, for the Frankenstein monster oh, and Dracula. In fact, okay. I'll tell you here, here's a little story for you. When they are, if you remember the movie at all, you know there there's the moment where they're going to finally transplant Lou Costello's brain out of his body and put it into the monster. You know, <laughs> sure. So Dracula, you know, I want no one with a fiendish intellect to challenge me. You know, uh. all that stuff. So they're going <laughs> to pop Lou's brain out. Okay, he's on the operating table. And the Frankenstein monster breaks loose, if you remember, and kills the nurse who's oh, the evil right, right, the know, evil assistant nurse. Yeah, to yeah. Count Dracula. All right. Picks her up and throws her out the laboratory window. Oh, my gosh. Okay. When they were filming that scene, and Glenn Strange was doing it, the uh, stunt woman was on a giant gimbal. Okay. So he pushes her to go through the candy glass, mm -hmm. didn't push her hard enough. She swung back and hit him. And he fell backwards, and he's wearing those big Frankenstein shoes. Yeah. And his ankle snapped in half. Ooh. So he is out. Yeah, he's done. So they he has to go to the hospital, and they're taking care of Glenn Strange. What do we do? We don't have a Frankenstein monster. So Lon Chaney Jr., to help out, got into, they made him up as the Frankenstein monster. He's really? already playing the Wolfman. Yeah, yeah. But you see, in the, it's very plain as day <laughs> in the in the shot that he you see him throw the nurse through through the window and she falls to her death and he turns towards camera and his of course the face is completely different because Lon's right. face is a lot fuller than Glenn Strange's was and he comes towards camera and that's uh, you know just to save the production a couple of bucks and not right right know, they they, they could keep Glenn Strange they, yep. they could keep shooting but if you watch in the for the rest of the film because those sections were shot pretty much in continuity. You can see Strange has a walking cast. I mean, he oh. kind of stumbles a little bit. Right, right. But yeah. How Frankenstein. Uh, that, of that's him. right. Because yeah, uh, yeah. he's got a walking cast he's on. He's got a walking cast on, yeah. I love, the, you know, it's always so fascinating when actors and, and people just keep going where you're like, you know, this is, this is, someone else can, they can cover this. This, why don't you heal up and not have like a weather ache for the rest of your life? Right, exactly. <laughs> because you didn't heal it correctly. Yep. But I've done, I, I know that I've done shows where I was like, did anyone enjoy that? Because I was ill. And uh, like, I literally had uh, one of those colds where my voice was like this and I'm telling jokes like this. And then I would have a coughing jag and then tears would course down my face. I'm like, who wants 45 minutes of that? How about you take a week off? How about you lie down for three days and you don't make $1,200 <laughs> and you and you work the next week? But because I still have people come up to me and going, that was the first time I saw you. That was, uh, I felt so bad for you. And I was like, that's not what I'm going for. And uh, so it was such a weird, <laughs> such a weird well, thing. Well, that's what I was, was going to ask you. Did people see the comparative performances and say, uh, that was amazing was yes. when you rose to the occasion. It was, uh, I believe the only joke I got out of that was uh, I had a coughing jig that was so bad that I cried. And I said, I'm crying about the litter. And it was an old reference to that uh, Native American uh, litter oh, sure. commercial from the 70s. And uh, uh, Iron the Eyes Cody, wasn't Was that, that the actor? That was who was the Indian. Yeah. Iron Eyes Cody. Mm hmm uh, we're here with uh, Courtney Joyner, who is a long box of information. <laughs> Holy smokes, <laughs> you are dipped. I want, but I want to talk about Elmore Leonard. Yes, because I've never been able to uh, get into one of his books. Really? Wait a minute. Did he write? Um, there might be two books that Andy, or one of his favorite books. Did he also write sort of a comedic L.A. private book? Well, he wrote uh, Get Shorty. Oh, did he write Get Shorty? Yes, and he wrote Be Cool. Okay. I think I might have... Okay, I might be mixing him up with a different... Like a guy who writes spy novels that I've never been able to write. Hmm. Which might... His name might also be Elmore. I'm trying <laughs> or to think Leonard. Who, who that might be. <laughs> I don't know. And, uh, no, I you know, he started with Westerns. Oh, did he? And uh, uh, he, was, uh, he was writing copy for... Uh, car companies in Detroit. And he always lived in Detroit. He always stayed he stayed He stayed in Detroit. He stayed in Detroit in Bloomfield Hills. Okay. And so he started selling short stories to pulp magazines and one of the first finally one of his stories was sold to the movies for only a few hundred dollars back then, but it wow. turned out to be a uh, classic uh, film 310 to Yuma. Oh my Glenn, gosh. Glenn Ford. Yeah. yeah. 
And then he also sold another one that became the movie The Tall T with uh, Randolph Scott and Richard Boone. Wow. Randolph Scott. What year was that? 1956. Okay. And so Elmore Leonard is... and But that was the thing. In those days, paperback writers and guys like that, I mean, you were writing for the pulps, you were writing for these cheap books, and there was very little regard for it, especially from the movies, except as a cheap way to get material. Right. And he knew that. And finally, one of his novels gets sold uh, to the movies and is made as a huge film. And that was Ombre with Paul Newman. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And he was paid, I think he told me, I want to say $3,500 for the rights to his book. What? And the screenwriters got a quarter of a million dollars. Right. And it is the novel just, just line for line. Yes. That did not set too well. Right. And uh, his wife got mad at him and said, you've got to do something about this. And Because uh, he was mad. And she was like, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Feel free and to get on but He was so horse. great. He said that, you know, he says, oh, I'm okay. I'm going to d- demand that I write uh, the screenplay to the next uh, next thing I ever sell. And he did sell one. He started writing crime novels. He sold a, a book called The Big Bounce. Okay. He wrote the script. And as he said had the honor of writing what he thought was the worst movie he had ever seen in his life, and it destroyed his screenwriting career for, oh, <laughs> for, for decades. For a while. Yeah. And then he finally came back. And he actually, it was funny because he was having the the literature mm-hmm. uh, became, you know, uh, High Noon in Detroit, 52 Pickup, uh, these just uh, out of sight, of course. Uh, and it created Justified, you know, I mean. Are they all Westerns? These, oh, no, are, all- these are all the crime the, the crime, crime novels yes. that he's... Yeah, I, uh, I don't know if you can see, but I read a fair amount of pulp. And I, I'll read, like, those Helen McGinnis books. I was just, oh, yeah. I was just talking about those. Uh, I accidentally, you know, I was just over at the Iliad Bookstore, which is this used bookstore. Um, I love the Iliad. Yeah, right? And, uh, and so they will have... I'm just like, I need something. And uh, the book nerds who work, work over there are like... What are you looking for? Well, let's narrow it down. Well, what about this shelf? And, uh, and then all of a sudden you have a new author and you tend to you blaze through it. Like, have you read Ross Thomas? Mm-hmm. Okay. Because remember, I, did they ever make any movies out of Ross Thomas books? Because the Ross... The, I don't know that they This did. one was... A, this book, Missionary Stew... Yes. ...is a book that I was, I was traveling through Europe in 1989 and it was in English. That's why I read it. And so I came home and I kept it because it was so good. And I could never find another book by him until I went to the Iliad probably five years ago. Well, you know, he was always kind of writing about the upper crust and all that stuff. In fact, uh, did you see this quote on the back? What? What Elmore Leonard does for crime in the streets, Ross Thomas does for crime in the suites. Oh, there you go. Because he was fancier. Is. There yeah. you go. Right, That's right. It. So, so Elmore Leonard had his Detroit cred. Never, yep. n- n- never. Uh, and he, this missionary stew and a lot of Ross Thomas stuff is set in D.C. with uh, journalists and, and fancy right. politicians and well, stuff and like that. Well, and you know, Helen McGinnis... Uh, they only made a few movies from her work. The novels were always much more successful, but she came along really in that explosion after Ian Fleming and well, everybody. And the first one I read was she wrote it in forty one, and it was set in thirty eight, and it was about Nazis. And the yep. and she was in London being bombed on while she's writing about Nazis That's in right. Germany in thirty eight. I was like. That, that had to be a surreal experience, looking back on it. Because I think when when uh, John le Carré and, and Ken Follett and all those guys really reappeared, a lot of her work, as I understand it, was actually reprinted from that period. So she found herself on the shelf with those guys. And then they made a not particularly good movie out of one of her books, uh, The Venetian Affair. Right. I have The Venetian Affair. It's a pretty good book. It's yeah. a pretty good it book. It was done in kind of, kind of a eh, movie with Robert Vaughn, but Boris Karloff is in it. Oh, is he? Yes, he All is. All right. And what about Above Suspicion? That was, that was I think, the the, the oh, book that turned into a great movie. Yes. Yeah, and of that, hers. That was, uh, well, now, was her novel turned into the Joan Crawford film? I believe so. It was, um, so, here it is. I thought it said that it would... Um, that it was made into a, a motion picture. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe it I'm wrong. It could very well have been. Let's see. I'm because 
or the because there's I tried to read. Oh, maybe I'm thinking of the Salzburg connection. No, she did a bunch of Cold yeah, War Yeah, Salzb- Salzburg connection was also, that was uh, made into a movie as well. Right. and um, But she did a bunch of Cold War ones that were, um, the books themselves weren't as good as the movies, but the movies were pretty great. And But the Venetian Affair, the book was definitely better than the movie. Yes, it was, um, this very well could have been because this was, I don't know what the f- first publication history of this was. Uh, let's <coughs> see. Yep, it's this was no, yeah first appeared in uh, what is that saying? Night. It shows my eyeballs. Right. <laughs> I want to say nineteen. Don't me to look 50, at fifty. Yeah. Oh no, let's go all the way back. Was that? Oh right, the original publication date is what we're looking yes. for. Yes, this is fascinating radio. Yes, you guys. I know, isn't this it? This is amazing. Nineteen forty. No, this is the one. Nineteen forty-one. Okay, so nineteen forty-one. Yes. Yeah. So then that would have been the movie with Joan Crawford. Yeah. And I believe Basil Rathbone made it during the war. I believe, yes. like in forty-three. Yeah. And um, so, but so how when you got to, you got to meet Elmore Leonard mm-hmm. and uh, where what. I guess I think he's passed, right? He has. He no. was he was great to me. I his novels, whether it was the the ones in Florida, like Out of Sight, and uh, they did a wonderful version of The Switch, uh, which uh, just very a few years ago with Jennifer Aniston called Life of Crime. Okay, and that's the the great plot about the guys who kidnap the rich man's wife, not knowing that he's filed for divorce from her. Oh. And so no. they can't hold her for ransom. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, it was very, very good. Okay. And he he was d- really remarkable. And I wrote a book called The Westerners, uh, mm-hmm. which was a collection of interviews with all these guys that I had known over the years, like Warren Oates and all these great people. That's Glenn cool. Ford was in there and wow. everything. And, uh, but the publishers wanted one more. They wanted a big signature writer. Okay. Uh, an author. And so I just took a stab and <laughs> sent what I had done to Elmore Leonard, and to, and I, I get a phone call from him. Wow! Saying, and, "Sure, I'll, uh, I'll yeah, sure, I'd love to do this." And so we set the time, and uh, we did it. It, it did was. Did you do great. it over the phone, or did you fly we first there? First, did it over the phone, and I got to meet him. Late. Well, I had been to a few book signings, at okay, Maine, but this was. Um, then we got to meet after the interview. But one of the things was he was writing uh, one of his last novels, Djibouti, which is about pirates. Okay. And so uh, in Somalia. So before he even started talking, he's reading me uh, sections of his book because he's just now he's in the middle of writing it. Oh, my God. And I'm thinking, you know, this is being recorded. This is right. <laughs> oh he God. didn't care. You know, uh, he was great. And we after we did the interview, uh he, they, uh, the people who were kind of running his website and everything, mm-hmm. they really supported the book big time. And oh, that's great. Got his endorsement out. And then, and his son, uh, Peter Leonard, has been very nice to me. And when his dad died, they made sure I was invited to the memorial service oh, that's for neat. him out here and everything. So, yeah, that was, uh, that I really kind of treasure that. And I, I kept all of his phone messages. I, oh, yeah. that's awesome. Uh, yes, I still. <laughs> Of, you know, everyone's one of those, this is about to be deleted. And I quickly p- press nine 40 <laughs> times to you know, make sure it's not. Yeah, Right. Well, hilariously, because um, it is so interesting to me about writers. Like, I'm, I'm fascinated with people who finish books and people who write uh, novels and, and, and write screenplays and finish things, right? Mm-hmm. And then much less get them published and, and get out there. And it... I was I I did an interview for the Dork Forest with Cage Baker one time mm-hmm. and as we were talking she said, "Well, do you want to Well, I'm working on a book. Do you want to see it?" And I was like, "I want to give you all of my money because I love your book so much. Don't give me your stuff for free." <laughs> but it's such an interesting thing with writers and and we just all give it away so much and we don't respect like you're obviously a big Elmore Leonard fan, and you're like, yeah. you're reading me the next book? Wait a minute. And It didn't make a lot of sense. I, I was already around the moon at this point <laughs> that I was going to sit and have this great talk with him. Yeah, and, uh, so that is that is so wonderful that it's just nice to know that, that we all 
I don't, I, I don't know why it's nice to know that we all don't respect ourselves as much as others do. Uh, <laughs> but it's <laughs> that's sort of, a very, a very beautiful way to put it. Yes, it's, it's uh, a, it's a, it, our, you know, the people who like your work are sometimes can. You know, and it keeps you humble. I mean, it it, it makes you much more uh, sufferable with your friends and family. So, because we we hope, we hope, because uh, if if I were as big a fan as I am of, let's say, my greatest fan, I would be insufferable to be around. <laughs> so, <laughs> no. uh, live and learn. So, what would so if someone were to start reading Elmore Leonard, like myself, who would you, what would you recommend to start with? If you're going to read a western. The one I would suggest is Valdez is Coming. Valdez is Coming, okay. Which was made into a very good movie with Burt Lancaster. Okay. I love a Burt Lancaster movie for some reason. Uh, except there's no not reason, because he's great. But uh, I, I, can't, I literally can't even picture him right now. But the visceral reaction that I have of Burt Lancaster is, oh, no, I love that guy. Yes. And <laughs> so Valdez is Coming. Valdez is Coming. And I would say for uh, uh, the crime novels... Yeah. Probably, if you were going to start anywhere, I would say uh, either 52 Pickup or uh, High Noon in Detroit. Okay. Uh, either or. Or uh, Bandits is quite good, too. <laughs> okay. It's uh, because... Or, or And if you want just a great movie reference, you can always go to Out of Sight. Oh, what's Out of Sight? Uh, they made the wonderful uh, movie with, uh, of it with, with Clooney, G- with George Clooney. That was Elmore Leonard. Oh, was it? Sure, absolutely. Uh, oh, okay, um, I heard that. That's a great movie. Oh, it's a wonderful movie. The, it's uh, tremendous. It's a uh, Ju- uh, Julia. Uh, who else was in it? Uh, uh, it's was J Lo. It? It, it was J Lo. It was Jennifer Lopez. Absolutely. Yeah. There we go. Out of sight. It's a. Uh, uh, it's funny that I have and Ving uh, Rhames and Steve Zahn and all kinds really? of wonderful people. Yeah, okay. That's terrific. Don yeah. Cheadle, and Don Cheadle, little small scrawny Don Cheadle is absolutely terrifying in this thing. Oh, really? Yeah, he is. He's the bad guy. Bad news. Yeah. Holy smokes. Okay. Um, yeah, because I like an action movie, and that's supposed to be an excellent one, actually. It's and, a very good movie. Yeah, yeah and it's uh, and it's it's crime or is it spy? No, it's crime. Okay, and um, that's fascinating. Well, what are your favorite spy novels? Since you're like we keep drifting over here to right. It's a uh, well. I mean the the I I did this. This was said to me yesterday. I said you know you read so much. And I read so much. It's amazing. There's absolutely no overlap. What the hell are you reading? And uh, But it's true. It's the uh, same thing with, with television and movies. There's the things that I watch and see. There's almost no overlap with everyone that I meet. I have no idea what I'm watching, and but I'm constantly doing something. I have a stack of 40 comic books in the back room that I'm about to read. and um, But I've read... Like, on that shelf, there would be a lot of Spencer for Hire novels. Sure. I, I uh, worked on Spencer for Hire. Oh, the TV show? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's... Um, um, I didn't mind it. I thought the books were a lot more... You know, here's the thing about a, a pulp novel that, that can happen that doesn't... In, including, like, these... And probably Elmore Leonard is that the message in such a thing... There's always what I call a B-plot. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of a... A secret message, whether it is uh, right wing or left wing, or just a, a, a be a grown up kind of message, whatever it is, it's always in something that is not not as respected. You know, like pulp novels, like all of the Louis L'Amour novels. Yeah, they were they were great. They were great action. You know. 180 pages of good times with horses and box canyons and some guy sticking his fist in a wall and muscling him his way out of a flood. And, uh, but it was, it was always that. And there was, um, the same with Spencer Ferrari novels is the fact that the message is just sort of, you know, this, this honesty and honorability and, and, and friendship. Well, the thing, the thing is too, thinking about those writers, like Robert Parker, Donald Hamilton, and Matt Helm, John D. McDonald, oh, right, Travis right. McGee's, uh, Elmore Leonard, whoever, all of these guys existed in the world of paperback publishing. Right. Because that's what bl- exploded after World War II. And what they were doing, it, it just meant that there was a place for their work. 
And critically, were they on a different level than, say, someone like Mickey Spillane, who at the time he was, was considered like a national plague almost when uh, his first books were published? The reviews were so terrible. Okay. But he outsold everybody. Oh, right. And so it was a, it was a weird time. Now, with Louis L'Amour, there, I have some issues with Louis L'Amour because he basically wrote the same novel about 300 times. Oh, for sure. Yeah. and I don't were, know if you ever read the one about the lone guy who comes into town and helps somebody. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> but that's a Jack Reacher novel, too. Well, but exactly. Right. And But, you know, with, with L'Amour, um, I had a, a very good friend. He, he's passed away now. Named, when I joined the Western Writers of America which was an organization I really wanted to get involved with. Yeah. And they actually rejected me the first few times. What? Because I didn't have the credentials. Okay. I finally got in because of all my writings and magazines about Western movies. Okay. So they accept me. I tell you, this was the thing. I go to the very first convention, and I'm meeting John Jakes and all of these right, you know, right. incredible authors uh, who were so generous and so open Mm -hmm. And one of the great things that I learned from all from these really just paramount people who who I was running into was that the movies were secondary. Right. The movies came to them as kind of frosting on the cake because they thought of themselves as novelists first. Right. And one of the people I got to know very, very well was a writer named Bill Gulick. Okay. And Bill wrote a novel called Bend of the Snake that was turned into a movie called Bend of the River with Jimmy Stewart and okay. Rock Hudson. Oh, wow. It was a very big Western in the 1950s. He, he wrote a Burt Lancaster movie, The Hallelujah Trail with, okay. uh, with Lee Remick. Okay. Lee Remick. And Bill knew Lou L'Amour very, very well. Okay. And Louis L'Amour was one of the founders of this organization. And there was, seemed to be resentment towards him. And it wasn't just because – it wasn't just his, his – they resented the success – but Bill brought up a great fact about Louis L'Amour. He said, look, writers, we hide. Mm -hmm. We stay in the shadows. We hole up in our little dens and we write these things. Lou got in front of cameras. He made himself a brand name. He made himself a celebrity. Uh-oh. He's th that guy. He was that guy. And he... and So other writers so, are good at me. Yeah. Uh, his sales just absolutely, you know, mm -hmm. went through the sky. And... But the other writers, they didn't have the personal tools to do that very same thing. Right. So he probably helped the genre. Uh, Tremendously. Yeah. Right. But nobody wants to hang out with that guy. Exactly. Right. You're yeah. just like, oh, that guy's a, he's a brand guy. He's a marketer dude. He's actually will not stop talking about, like I tend to talk about um, money and marketing and, and ad stuff, ways to help, but I don't. But what I, I mostly want to do is stand up, you know, it's what I mostly want to do is the thing. And that's what these writers, clearly, that's what they wanted. Well, it to was do. just a, the idea of uh, fame as an author was something that slowly grew, you know, through the, through the 50s and 60s. Uh, Irving Wallace's daughter, Amy, who okay. unfortunately has passed away, was a good friend of mine. And she used to talk about her dad. How many times that he would be on the Mike Douglas show or the Johnny Carson show right. when they had new novels coming out. And that period during the 60s, thanks to people like Harold Robbins and Jacqueline Suzanne yeah. and all these, writers were famous. Yeah. You Stephen knew who King. They were. You knew John who they Jakes. were. Yeah. yeah. You saw their faces. Mm -hmm. That has completely changed. Everybody's anonymous again. I mean, you're on social media and you do that type of thing. Right. But writers are not the talk show guests anymore. That's right. Unless, well, Colbert does a little of it, but right. it's mostly memoirs and, and, and nonfiction. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And and th that whole thing of the fiction writers hitting the New York Times bestseller list mm -hmm. and those towers of books in the yeah. window of Brentano's and all that type of stuff, it, all of that's changed because the market's changed and e-books and what right. have you and tablets and, and all those things. So what you and I are talking about and all these different things is – it's it's exhausting, uh, no matter what media you're working in, because you have to keep up with absolutely everything, because you never know where what you're doing is going to land. Where's it going right. to be? Where is it going? It's like because you made this board game. Yep. Something you've you've never been into gaming. Absolutely. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, it is it is a story that we could make into a game if you would like a game. Yeah. And um, so it's 
it's funny because Andy teaches at a tech school here in mm-hmm. Los Angeles, and it's and it's a it's a school that does film, game design, and um, uh, script writing and uh, animation, and so he is in a trans narrative class. Mm-hmm. And the trans narrative class, you have to take one idea, like like Nemo Rising, your game. Uh, I'm here, by the way, with Courtney Joyner. And, uh, and you have to write a script. You have to shoot that script. You have, so you have to cast it and film it and then cut it and make a short. And then you also have to turn it into an animation and you have to turn it into a game. There we a go. A video game. Uh, and not a board game, a video game. And so there's a lot of programming. So all of these, and I say kids, but because they're in their early twenties, and and uh, but they're they have to know how to program, they have to know how to animate, they have to know how to script write, and then they have to know how to shoot and uh, and edit film. Well, that's well. You see, that's that's the perfect example because anymore, if you go into uh, any producer's office or a production company or whatever it is, and you sit down and you discuss an idea with them invariably now how many times has this happened to you where they say is this franchisable oh god yeah it it is the first question that seems to come out of everybody's mouth right it's just like it's almost like they've been handed some sort of card <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> it's like don't forget to ask don't forget is it to ask franchisable? Is this, <laughs> yeah i've been given this task and uh you're like sort of maybe and that's the wrong answer the right answer is of course yeah of course it is <laughs> And, uh, yeah, and, and the thing is, you're sitting there saying, well, I just pitched an idea about the death of my cat. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, well, right. We'll, right. we'll see. Oh, that's life number one. Here are the next eight lives. Right. Yeah, so. Well, and the Dork Forest has been, um, I've, I've done some sort of uh, out filming with it. Uh, matter of fact, you might know this guy because I, I met him through Matt Weinhold and Dana Gould was... Uh, the guy, his last name might be Peck, and he owns all the uh, Battle of uh, Planet of the Apes paraphernalia. Oh, sure. No, I know who that is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. And so he just he turned his garage into a battle, uh, into a Planet of the Apes uh, museum, and I did a live. So I I, I did some, a, I just did stills because it was probably fifty. Uh, I don't know, it would have been 10, 11 years ago, and I didn't have an iPhone. I think I had a flip phone, and so I didn't make a movie out of it. But I did do some sort of. Um, but that was like, there are several different layers that, you know, where you can turn something into a game and you could turn something into a movie and stuff. And, but all of the, all of the authors, like Elmer Leonard, he was just like, well, I just want to stay in Detroit and write books. Well, of course, and then eventually, none, as they started, none of this stuff existed. Right. Right. Yeah. He, if you sold something to the movies or maybe you had something done for television, that was it. That was mm-hmm. the height of and that was Everything. your check. Yeah. That was your check. Mm-hmm. And it came out as a, if it's a short story or something. It's like I'm doing a thing on universal uh, horror films here in a little bit. And uh, what are the, what is that? The it's, horror films that Universal shot? That Universal made. Okay. And when you go back and you think about, you know, in 1931 and they're shooting Frankenstein or whatever it is that we're doing, even in the 40s in World War II with. Lon Chaney Jr. doing a mummy movie, say, mm-hmm. on the back lot or something. <laughs> the thing is, those movies were only going to exist for the al- amount of time they played in a movie theater. There was no television. Right. So there was no life to that work beyond the two weeks, or if you were, had a hit, five weeks at the movie theater. And that was it. it. That was it. Because even reissues were, were rather rare. And of course, and it, everything kind of caught up with itself. But at the time, these men and these women were doing this work. It was very finite. disposable. It was finite. Absolutely it was. I've never even thought of that. The thing is, they're making a movie and you're like, well, that movie, well, we have that movie. That is a classic movie. It's available on DVD and streaming. And you're like, at the time, they were like, well, we don't know what we'll do with this film afterwards. We'll keep it. But will we get to show it again? Like, exactly. so they, they will spend nine months or whatever, a year and a half making a film that they know is going to run for three weeks. That's, oh, and then next up. Yeah, does anybody think that, like, Humphrey Bogart thought about what was going to happen after Casablanca was finished? No. That it was going to be shown. I watched it, was it the other night. It was going to be and that was it. Yeah. That was the whole plan. That's it. Sure. Well, that is fascinating because that is a perspective that makes. It makes you it it it's so much more immediate. Like they're living in that moment. Absolutely. 
Huh? <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> I love it, that. It, it, yeah, it's just a mindset that's so completely different from the way we have to approach what we do now. Right. Yeah. Every 13 year old is told everything you put on the internet is forever. Everything you put on, you want to put fi- pictures of your feet, they're going to show up on Wiki Feet. Please do not put pictures of your feet on the, on the internet. That's it. You're 13. And that is a different mindset than in 1930. 1935, where you're like, we're making a movie, it's going to be great, and then it's going to be over. That's right. What? My mind has been... Courtney Joyner, my mind has been blown. Oh, well. Uh, (laughs) It has been an hour, so you should know that. We should tell people that uh, they should uh, find you on Amazon, all of your works, and then possibly buy it at a place that isn't Amazon. Or uh, use my link. Huh? Huh? There you go. One of those two things. But uh, Nemo Rising... It's going to be available at all those places, too. But your best bet and what would help uh, Courtney join you in this fascinating tale would be to go to your local game store and ask them to order it for you. Uh, because that will put it in front of your local game store's brain box. And that will help them. Thank you very much. Yes, you- from WizKids. From WizKids. It's called Nemo Rising. Thank you so much for this. This was great. Well, thank you very much. This was terrific. All right. And Rangers, you know the rules out there. Take care of each other. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat, <laughs> my hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. Thank we you. Why don't we just call that as the end of the show?